Farm Week is a production of the Mississippi State University Extension Service. Today on Farm Week, Mississippi farmers are still assessing how last Tuesday's record cold snap affected livestock and pastures. We'll have highlights of the Mississippi Fruit and Vegetable Growers Association's annual conference. In Southern Gardening, zone appropriate plants. They can survive better and last longer. In the markets, soybeans trade lower on the threat of big South American crops while cattle prices set a record to start the new year. John Michael Riley will have analysis. In the feature segment, the Teacher Conservation Workshops. For 50 years, these workshops have helped to teach Mississippi school educators about how they can help their students learn about modern forestry and conservation. I can identify trees for them, show them ways to identify trees, um, the invertebrates that we found in the river, the creek, um, and also to talk about the conservation and how that's important for that they take care of it as well because if they don't take care of it, it won't be here later on. Good day everyone, I'm Leighton Spann. And I'm Artis Ford, welcome to Farm Week. Mississippians are still recovering from the polar vortex that hit the state on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday of this week. Well Leighton, many locations in the state set new record lows on January 7th, the coldest day. Now some locations not only set record lows, they also set record high temperatures, that is, the lowest high for that date. So far, Mississippi farmers are still assessing what the freezing weather did to plants and animals. Many expect, <clears throat> many expect to find frostbite on livestock and in some cases dead animals. Ford Specialist Rocky Lemus with the Mississippi State University Extension Service said that temperatures below 15 degrees will certainly damage winter grazing annuals like ryegrass and clovers. Ryegrass's ability to tiller or spread will certainly be slowed. Some Bermuda glass may be killed, especially if it was lightly dissed for planting ryegrass. Supplemental feed and hay will be needed. Now the lowest temperature record in Mississippi this week was four degrees at Eupora, uh, west of Starkville. Corinth reported five degrees with Pascacoola reporting 19 degrees. The local food movement has helped many communities to start farmers markets. It's hard to have local food if there's not a local source for it. How to start a successful farmer's market was one of the items covered at the annual conference of the Mississippi Fruit and Vegetable Growers Association. Farm Week's Amy Taylor reports. With consumers growing interest in supporting local economies and purchasing fresh fruits and vegetables, shopping at your local farmer's market is no longer a thing of the past. Retired Mississippi State University Extension Service agent James Richmond says visitors at the Mississippi Fruit and Vegetable Growers Association Conference wanted to learn how to start a farmer's market. First you need to know what, do you have a population base that will support your market? Uh, and that will help determine then how many growers it will actually take to be able to supply the market so that you will have adequate produce and of course that, that is a key to a farmer's market is having a supply, an adequate supply. The location for a farmer's market it needs to be visible. As we used to say in business, the three most important uh, aspects of a business is location, location, location. Well that's also true with the farm at market because we actually have a physical location where you have the farmers that will gather and then a place for the consumers to come by. Additionally, Richmond says the climate must be suitable for the type of crop a producer plans to grow. Shelley Johnston, founder of the Hernando Farmers Market, explains how small details make a difference for market vendors. Well, one of the things I talk to the vendors about is to make sure that their booth space is attractive 
as I mentioned to the group today, many of the farmers market customers go to the market for the experience of being at the market. Nobody spends two or three hours in the grocery store because it's just not as much fun as it might be going to the market. So I ask them to maybe use cloth, tablecloths instead of plastic and to use baskets on the table instead of plastic containers. Uh, plastic can be a little off-putting and the customers are just drawn to something that's more natural. Furthermore, Johnston says it's important to advertise on the internet by keeping updated websites, Facebook and Twitter pages. The Mississippi Fruit and Vegetable Growers Association Conference was held at the Pearl River Resort Hotel and Casino. From Choctaw, Mississippi, I'm Amy Taylor reporting. Well, with this week's Arctic blast, many people are wondering if their landscape plants have been hurt or killed by it. In this week's Southern Gardening segment, Extension Horticulturist Dr. Gary Bachman will show us that zone hardy plants can help to prolong the garden season. Here on the coast, we've just had several nights below 30 degrees. Today I'm visiting my friends Lisa and Marty to see how their new landscape withstood the cold temperatures. While some of the more tropical plants were sensitive to the cold, the bulk of Lisa and Marty's landscape are plants that are appropriate for their planting zone. The primary ground cover plant is chocolate chip ajuga, which has narrow foliage that is dark green with chocolatey brown highlights. This is an enthusiastic grower and has been planted where the growth can be contained. Butterfly weed, known botanically as Asclepias tuberosa, was chosen as a Mississippi medallion native plant in 2012. Butterfly weed grows to 36 inches tall and 24 inches wide. This plant has an upright clumping growth habit. Even late into the year, the clusters of tubular flowers with various shades of orange, yellow, or red are still attracting monarch butterflies. Shell ginger continues to provide color throughout the landscape. Planted around the large urn fountain, the variegated leaves are dramatic with their striking irregular green and yellow stripes. Garden art always adds to the landscape interest. The Mississippi medallion winner Shishi Gashira Camellia with its pink blooms is the perfect background for their St. Francis statue. In adding interest are the Satsuma orange trees planted in the front beds, which will make for some really delicious edible landscaping. As you can tell from this landscape, zone appropriate plants can help prolong garden beauty. I'm horticulturist Gary Bachman for Southern Gardening. If you want to know the plant zone where you live, go to the zone map at the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Go to the website planthardiness.ars.usda.gov. There you can type in your zip code or find a map of the plant zones for your state. In the feature segment today, see how Mississippi school teachers are learning how to incorporate forestry and conservation into their class curriculums. Time now for the Markets with Layton and the January USDA reports came out Friday the 10th at noon Eastern time. And ahead of that, the corn trade was fairly cautious during the week ahead of these new numbers, expecting a record crop figure as well as big increases in the ending stocks. Now also artists in the markets this week, cattle prices shift higher with the beginning of 2014 and informal polls suggest U.S. cotton acreage may rise while soybean prices slide south. Some record high fat cattle prices since our last market segment before 2013 ended and there seems to be support for even feeder prices due to tight supplies. Extension Ag Economist John Michael Riley offered some analysis of the beef sector on Thursday morning. Well, the Fed cattle market definitely has brought a lot of attention on itself with these high prices. It sure has. Uh, we've seen a lot of positive news since about the middle of December. A cattle on feed report that was extremely bullish. Market took off, started taking off there. As we closed out 2013, we saw the S&P, the Dow, a lot of our barometers of the economy uh, moving to record levels. So that was uh, a good sentiment, if you will, for, for what the general economy was, was doing. So that speaks well to beef demand. And so both of those combined, the, the tight supply and the positive news, I guess, in terms of what beef demand might be for 2014, has had our, our live cattle, fed, feeder cattle market pretty strong coming into 2014. And Packers basically are having to pay up uh, to, get, to get the supplies they need at this point. That's right, and we've seen choice and select box beef move up as a result, you know, which, is, which has helped 
help them uh, increase the incentive for them to bid up. Uh, box beef prices have held up as well. So again, a lot of positive news if you look at just the, the prices throughout the supply chain for cattle. So uh, perhaps bullish as we go on into the year? Definitely on the supply side. I mean, we're continuing to see fewer numbers of cattle slaughtered, fewer numbers of, of cattle available. We're likely going to see more heifers retained, which means there's more heifers gonna, that are going to be in the feedlot. We've, we've already been seeing that. We could continue to see that. So from the supply side, I think it's definitely a positive uh, outlook. The question always is going to be, what is demand going to do? How is it going to hold up? you got winter weather like what we've been experiencing, not just in Mississippi. It's been really cold, but it's been cold everywhere else. That keeps uh, consumers inside, not out making those purchases. It also drives up their uh, electricity, their utility bills, which t chips away at their, their budget. Mm -hmm. So there are some, some uh, if you will, some, some Potential caveats. Potential clouds on the Caveats horizon. here, but mm -hmm. uh, for the most part, the outlook is strong as we've come into 2014. Now the, the feeder cattle market, they have uh, they have not set really any record prices, but they're still doing fairly well as far as prices. That's right. Uh, since about early December, up about $5 across the board, looking at all the different contracts. That, that market's going to continue to be tight, so uh, it's, it's not has been as strong in terms of record prices, but it's held up in, in throughout all of this. It seems like there could be fundamental support to uh, keep that underpinned. Of course, yes indeed. The extreme winter weather has impacted some livestock and dairy operations this week, especially in the Midwest. Cargill says it will likely operate its pork plants in Illinois, Iowa, and other locations on Saturday the 11th to make up for lost production volume due to weather-delayed hog shipments. And in Indiana, Michigan, and Kentucky, some dairies reportedly were forced to dump milk this week as the weather shut down roads and stranded trucks. Well, our trivia quiz this week concerns some agricultural history, and here's your first look at it. What piece of equipment did the Rust Brothers invent? Is the answer the cotton gin, or the disc harrow, or the three-point hitch, or the mechanical cotton picker? I'll tell you at the end of the markets. We're going to pause for a short break on Farm Week. Coming up, we'll look at the calendar and the rest of the markets. Leighton Span reports it was bearish news for soybeans, while there could be more U.S. cotton acreage this year. In the feature segment today, see how the Teachers Conservation Workshop is educating teachers on modern forestry and conservation. Every day, real people are solving problems, learning skills, and achieving goals through extension education. We care about their success and yours. Extending knowledge, changing lives. The MSU Extension Service. Before we get back to the markets, let's look at the Farm Week calendar. Four food safety workshops are planned for Mississippi produce growers from now through March. These workshops will help growers gain certification and learn how to grow high quality fruits and vegetables. The MSU workshops are free, but farmers must pay for each individual audit of their farms to complete the certification. Farmers who successfully pass the workshop, however, can apply for a cost share program through the Mississippi Department of Ag and Commerce to help cover the cost of the initial audit. The first workshop takes place Monday, January 13th at the Forest County Extension Service Office in Hattiesburg. The second is Monday, February 10th. The 41st Delta Ag Expo will make its run. That's Thursday and Friday, January 23rd and 24th. It takes place in Cleveland, Mississippi at the Bolivar County Expo Center located near the intersection of highways 8 and 61. There's no admission fee. In addition to the many vendors who will be on site, there will also be several education sessions. An irrigation roundtable will be held Thursday morning. Thursday afternoon sessions include cotton, soybeans, and a pipe planting seminar. Friday morning, the sessions will cover rice, corn, small grains, and grain storage. Go to our Farm Week website at farmweek.msucares.com for information on these and other events. Now check out this week's Farm Week Snapshot. This week's Beltwide Cotton Conferences generated some bearish news in the opinion of many analysts. There is word that a preliminary poll of 2014 cotton planting intentions at that meeting indicates producers are planning to increase cotton acreage this year by 8 percent. Dones reports that if realized, that would be the first increase in planted cotton acreage in three years. Tumbling corn and bean prices are given as one reason. 
Much of the trade had been expecting another decline in cotton acreage. The National Cotton Council releases an annual planning intention survey on February 8th. The potential of a record crop of soybeans in South America continues to be the bearish news weighing on the bean market. Analyst Elaine Cub says the January 10th USDA numbers should confirm the impact of Brazilian and Argentinian crops on global bean supplies. Looming over this, this for, for months now has been the idea that the Brazilian and Argentinian crops are going to be huge. And that is continuing to be the case, and even more so. I think that's what really triggered it this week. There has always been this idea that it had been a little bit dry, but the forecast turned very decidedly wet right as it's filling the pods. You know, we're fairly safe to say that they're going to get the 88 million metric tons in Brazil, possibly up to 90 million metric tons is an idea that has been tossed around. So that could be some very bearish news coming in, again, on that January 10th report. So somewhere between now and next November, there's a $1.57 spread between the old crop and new crop soybean futures, and those are going to have to come together somewhere. And my, my feeling is that it's probably going to be closer to the downside, to the new crop prices. Wrapping up the markets in forestry products, USA Today reports that hardwood plywood production capacity in the U.S. has shrunk 25 percent just since 2009. This downturn in new home construction and China's increasing share of the market are being cited as the primary reasons. This story says 25,000 jobs were lost due to the diminished production. Well, before the feature story, let's check out the trivia answer for this week. The correct choice is D. The Rust Brothers invented the mechanical cotton picker, which was demonstrated in 1936 at the Delta Branch Experiment Station in Stoneville. And our feature story segment today, Forestry in the Classroom. This past summer, the Teachers Conservation Workshop celebrated its 50th year. The two, the, the two week-long workshops exposed teachers to all aspects of Mississippi forestry and how to teach resource conservation to their students. The Mississippi Forestry Association created the Teacher Conservation Workshops. Farm Week's Amy Taylor brought us this story last summer. When it's over, we'll have the dates for this year's workshops. At the Teachers Conservation Workshops conducted by the Mississippi Forestry Association, it would be difficult to briefly summarize all there is to learn. To accommodate teachers from the northern and southern ends of the state, two separate workshops are held, one at Northeast Mississippi Community College in Boonville and another at Jones County Junior College in Ellisville. Mississippi State University Extension Service Forester Butch Bailey says educators, professionals, and personnel from MFA MSU Extension Service and Mississippi Forestry Commission were on hand to teach participants about all things forestry. The Teachers Conservation Workshop is a week-long educational program that the Mississippi Forestry Association has been conducting for 50 years. This is our 50th anniversary. We're pretty proud of that. And what we do is we take a group of about 20, 25 teachers every year and we spend one week teaching them everything we possibly can about forestry in Mississippi, from nurseries to um, the various management regimes from private landowners to public landowners to big industry. Additionally, Bailey says the teachers visited large logging and lumber mills, sawmills, and national and state forests, as well as privately owned forests. They got an inside look at Mississippi forestry from tree planting to harvesting to safety procedures used at the various facilities. Soil variety, quality, and erosion were also discussed. First grade teacher Amy Taylor explains some of the activities at TCW. We did measurement and evaluation and we determined the diameter of trees and how many logs we can get from the trees. To, or to see how many boards we can get from a log. We did some leaf tree identification. Um, we've learned to um, tell the different types of trees um, according to their leaves, their bark, um, their fruit. We've played some, a game this morning with the tree identification that um, we can use um, to incorporate into our classrooms. In addition, Taylor says she has an even greater appreciation for forestry and wildlife and explains how TCW will help her educate her students. I can identify trees for them, show them ways to identify trees, um, the invertebrates that we found in the river, the creek, um, and also to talk about the conservation and how that's important for 
that they take care of it as well because if they don't take care of it, it won't be here later on. Furthermore, Taylor says she and fellow participants were pleased to learn about the careful conservation steps Mississippi foresters take, such as planting approximately six trees for every tree that's cut and making sure to utilize all parts of the tree. In addition to outdoor and hands-on activities, classroom sessions offered an array of interesting topics discussing various wildlife species and habitats, water quality, testing the strength of wood, and even the different sizes of pine cones. Additionally, extension forestry professor Dr. Glenn Hughes discusses how Project Learning Tree was used to help teach some of the workshop sessions. Project Learning Tree is a uh, uh, program that's developed by an organization called the American Forest Foundation, and Project Learning Tree is an environmental education program. Uh, they, they have a, a really nice series of booklets that they develop, books that they develop for teachers that have practical exercises that teachers can take, can utilize in their classroom. Dr. Hughes says you wouldn't expect to be able to teach math, social studies, and human sciences using forestry, but Project Learning Tree makes that possible through activities offered on kindergarten through 12th grade levels. Additionally, Dr. Hughes and Butch Bailey elaborate more on why it's important to teach forestry and resource conservation in schools. Forestry and forest products are a significant part of the economy of the state. Uh, in excess of $10 billion per, uh, per year for the state of Mississippi. So it's a tremendous part of our economy and it's part of the, the, uh, the teacher. It affects the teachers directly and indirectly because we have 16th section lands and the revenue from timber, for example, on 16th section lands goes directly to the, uh, to the school system. Hey, and when you're talking about Mississippi history, it is forestry or at least logging and, and timber harvest. That's, that's why Mississippi was settled. It's most of us who live in Mississippi now are here because our ancestors were in some way connected to the timber industry. Furthermore, educators at the Teachers Conservation Workshop recognized the priority of explaining the roles of various forestry-related organizations and institutes. For example, Mississippi Forestry Association Program and Event Coordinator Elena Pope says MFA is often confused with Mississippi Forestry Commission. The Mississippi Forestry Commission is your state agency headed by the state forester and they have county offices throughout Mississippi so you'll hear about your county forester or your service forester. The Mississippi Forestry Association is a membership organization so if you want to be a part of MFA we tell you what your dues would be and a private landowner does not pay the same dues as a large company would pay. In addition, Pope explains one of the perks of being a member of the Mississippi Forestry Association. We are there to represent them anytime that there's a, a bill coming up, whether it's something we need to support or not support. And we have a committee that meets to, that makes the decision of which bills we're supporting. Our members receive a weekly legislative bulletin during the legislative session and so they are always the first to know about these issues and we send it out on Friday afternoon after the legislature convenes. Another benefit for MFA members is receiving the quarterly newsletter addressing current forestry issues and containing articles that feature Mississippi State University forestry educators, MFA members, and others in forestry. Along with 50 years of teachers conservation workshops, Mississippi Forestry Association is also celebrating its 75th year in existence and this is the 25th year since Project Learning Tree began. As for participants reactions to TCW, Butch Bailey says the remarks are excellent. The response we get from the participants, from the teachers about TCW is uniformly positive. Uh, it's glowing. One of my jobs with TCW is compiling the evaluations that we get after each workshop. And I can tell you that, you know, without exception, there are just no negative comments. So we get comments, teachers saying it's, it's the best continuing education workshop they've ever done. They're so glad they had no idea how important forestry was and those are the ones that are really gratifying. If I teach an adult that's a good thing but if you can teach a teacher about forestry well you've just multiplied your efforts exponentially. 
Following five decades of successful teacher conservation workshops, participants and educators believe that through continuous efforts in resource conservation, Mississippi forestry will be well prepared to serve future generations. I'm Amy Taylor reporting. And you can watch this story on the Teachers Conservation Workshop on our Farm Week website, Facebook page, or YouTube. The website address is farmweek.msucares.com. The Mississippi Forestry Association has set the dates for the 2014 uh, workshops. They will be starting June 8th and 22nd. The cost is $100 plus lodging. We'll have the links on our website and Facebook page to the MFA and the workshop registration form. Now, usually the two sessions are limited to about 25 uh, per person mm -hmm. in terms of uh, teachers that can come to those. So you need to go ahead and get your registration in. And it has been around for 50 years. And I think that right there says... They're doing it right. Must be doing something yeah. right. Because otherwise, what? People wouldn't come. They'd shut it down. So right. if you're a school teacher, consider looking into that. And if you've been before, you can actually come back. They don't mind that either. So we are at the end of Farm Week for this week. On our next show... Farmtastic. More than 800 school children came to Mississippi State University to learn about how agriculture touches their lives, including sports. The students were shown how vegetables are grown, what forest products they use daily, and how clothing is made. In Southern Gardening, Winter Gardens, there are a variety of plants available for great winter color. For the rest of the Farm crew, I'm Artis Ford. And I'm Leighton Spann. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next week.